Hello, everyone, and welcome to the uh, most technologically and geographically ambitious pizza talk um, the Coatsen has had so far. Uh, my name is Eddie Cleofe. I'm a second year PhD student in the archaeology IDP at the Coatsen, and uh, we'd like to start today with a land acknowledgement. So the Coatsen Institute at UCLA acknowledges the Gabrieliano Tongva peoples as the traditional land caretakers of Tuvangar, the Los Angeles Basin and South Channel Islands. As a land-grant institution, we pay our respects to the Honukbetam ancestors, Ahihirom elders, and Ayohimkim, relatives and relations, past, present, and emerging. I'm very excited to introduce professors Giorgio Bucciolatti and Marilyn Kelly Bucciolatti. Giorgio Bucciolatti and Marilyn Kelly Bucciolatti are a husband and wife team who have worked together for many years in the Near East, especially in Syria, Iraq, and Turkey. Uh, they directed excavations at Turka, Tel Kaira, and Tel Ziada in Syria, and they served on the staff of the excavations at Nippur in Iraq and Kurushko Tepe in Turkey. They are at present co-directors of the archaeological expedition to Tel Mozan Erkesh in northeastern Syria, and work closely together both in the field and on the publication reports from their excavations, of which several volumes plus four audiovisual presentations have appeared so far. They lead an international staff comprising colleagues and students from the US, Europe, and Asia. Since the start of the war in Syria, they have been actively involved in what has become the Irkesh Extended Project, aimed at the active preservation of the site. For this work, the project has received medals from the Archaeological Institute of America and from the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. The project has recently won the European First Prize for Heritage-Led International Relations. Uh, everyone, please welcome or please join me in welcoming uh, Professors Giorgio Bucciolatti and Marilyn Kelly Bucciolatti. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ed and Didre. Um, you know, I was just thinking that it's a long time that um, I haven't suffered from stage fright. <laughs> but but uh, this is uh, an occasion for uh, having stage fright because, um, uh, as Eddie said, of the technological ambition that we have behind us. and the wide range really of, uh, of people that are that we see flashing that the names flashing on the um, in, on the board <clears throat> so we like to welcome all of you and uh, we hope that we can convey to you some of the feelings that we have had over the last several years um, the title uh, had um, the term a personal tale, because we really wanted it to be a sort of reflection on our personal involvement in um, archaeology seen as going beyond the process of excavation and of interpretation. Archaeology becoming sort of a factor, a motor in motivating uh, people um, today. And uh, so we will really uh, speak mostly about the uh, concepts that we have uh, developed. Although these concepts are, are really based on a, a very direct and practical involvement in the field. We are not going to give you the uh, description of what we have been doing, partly because we have done this in earlier talks for those who uh, were already uh, listening to us at the Kotsen. So we'll just go quickly through some of the um, factors that have been motivating us in, the, um, in these years. Uh, we really started in the, uh, during the excavations always having a keen sense of uh, the need for conservation. And we always did it in a very modest way, which has been our saving grace, because during the war, we have been able to maintain a, in really perfect uh, state the mud brick walls of the palace, which is what you see here now. It's a very simple system, as you see, with the curtains that open and allow the view inside. Um, it has worked very well. These uh, walls that you see here, uh, they were excavated over 30 years ago, and it's almost a miracle to see mud bricks so well preserved uh, still after so much time. Um, we uh, 
also put a great deal of emphasis on interpretation. And here again, you see how modest the means are. Uh, they're really printed sheets on uh, panels, which are uh, readily um, kept up to date. One can keep them up to date very, very well, but they're not fancy. And that has always been really our goal to reach for the substance. Here you see Amer, whom uh, you will meet in person in a few minutes because he's with us from Mozan itself, showing to a group of high school students the excavations. So we have the interpretation. We also organize uh, um, seminars for local university students um, who did not really have other sites where to practice, for instance, surveying or a study of architecture. So you see all of these pictures are really taken in the last few years. And it's uh, really very um, encouraging and surprising in a way to see how uh, productive the whole program has been. This is uh, another aspect of what uh, we started doing, always with Amer, whom you, you see here, presenting a slideshow in a private home in the villages. So the, uh, we have done 24 villages. We, by we, I mean Amer, but we really speak always as a we because we feel very connected and very much part of it. Um, in uh, private homes like this, so, so small groups, maybe 20, 30 people, but you see how varied they are. And schools, and here you see Mohammed sitting in the center, whom we'll also, you will also meet in a minute. This is the school in our own uh, village of uh, Mozan. Um, and then exhibits. We did a series of exhibits. Here again, Amer, who is uh, taking a group of students, and this was a poster for the exhibit. And this was the exhibit in Kamishli, the city uh, near the site, um, very uh, recently. And look at this date, for instance, November 2020. We have had visitors all the time. Um, and uh, this was a particularly impressive uh, performance of a youth orchestra that went to the Mozan and performed for us a um, piece of music on the steps. Now, this is really the uh, iconic picture, as it were, for the whole uh, talk, our talk today. That is, uh, you have the staircase, which is the remnant of a dead city. And then you have these young people full of enthusiasm on it today. So the real question that we I want to pose to you, how is it possible for a city that uh, became uninhabited and abandoned more than 3,000 years ago to stir such emotions? Um, we are really uh, looking at archaeology as cultural heritage. In what way can archaeology be considered heritage when the tradition uh, that uh, is represented in these ancient sites has been broken for so long? Um, two weeks ago, we had a, a beautiful talk in this same series by Glenn Wharton, a colleague who works in Hawaii, and it was really a very uh, symmetrical um, sort of presentation, symmetrical vis-a-vis -vis what we are doing today. He was talking about a very recent past, and he was saying how conservation helped him to go into, um, uh, again, a better understanding of the current traditions in Hawaii. It was a matter of conserving something which was very much uh, at the heart of the, uh, in the heart of these people. And so there was an interrelationship between the technical aspect of conservation and the pride of uh, heritage and the sensitivity of the local people for the heritage. Well, this is really not the, our situation and it's mostly not the case with the uh, um, archaeology, because in most cases we deal with 
long since uh, uh, the, the traditions that have long since uh, expired. Um, we have grown very much interested in uh, this respect that is uh, in presenting the data to the people, partly through the need that we felt all along to conserve the uh, monuments. We, you saw before, particularly the mud brick, even the stone monument like this one is, uh, is always in danger of, uh, of being uh, damaged, but the mud brick all the more so. And in this, we were really helped by uh, our partnership with the Getty Conservation Institute, in particular, Neville Agnew and Martha Dimas, who were at the site and encouraged us and have been encouraging us all along to continue on this path of uh, uh, conserving and presenting. So the uh, questions then that uh, we have uh, to ask again, the question is, how do we bring a dead city alive? And is it worth doing? Does it go beyond fantasy? Because we certainly remain archaeologists, we don't write novels. Uh, so to what extent can we really uh, motivate the people? And to what extent heritage is lived by inheritors? See, a key point is in our mind is that heritage is not a thing. It is also a thing. You see the staircase here, this monumental staircase. But it becomes heritage only when it is lived by the inheritors. And uh, this is really the uh, sort of goal of our talk today is to uh, explore how a a uh, monument, a thing, becomes a live uh, heritage. And we thought that the best way to uh, go to this was to go to the heart of the matter, was really to have a witness or a several witnesses, in fact, from our young Syrian collaborators. And um, they will really uh, introduce us to the final comments that we will make at the end about in her heritage as a lived uh, process. Well, we want to um, look deeper into our intellectual commitment um, that we have to archaeology and specifically today to the site of Orkash. Um, we want to um, show you how Orkash has become part of the life experience of five young Syrian archaeologists who have been exposed in different ways to um, heritage at um, Delmozan Orkesh. These interlocutors are here today with us and they will give us their personal, personal viewpoint, personal uh, tale. Um, and they represent now progressively um, different degrees um, of, of distance from the site. The first two um, are um, coming directly to you from the staircase um, in Mozan. There they are. Um, hello, um, hello, both of you. Um, Mohammed Omo um, and Amr, they are together today standing on the staircase at the site. Mohammed, um, the man on your right, um, was born and raised in Mozan. Um, and he is the most direct local inheritor um, who will speak to us today. He serves as the guard, and the guard in a very comprehensive sense. Um, he senses, we may say, um, the heartbeat of Orkesh and um, communicates it to us um, as he will now in his own words. He will um, speak to us and Amr will translate into English. Mohammed, we're very happy to see okay. you. I'm Hello, very sir. happy that you're sharing um, with us Absolutely. your experience uh, you? of the heritage at Orkash. Yes. Yes, Professor. I will translate uh, for Mohammed. Uh, I will uh, I will talk to, uh, to in, in Kurdish. I will trans, uh, translate it in English. Uh, so, Mohammed, you can talk now. Hello, sir. Mohammed, 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 Mohamm
My name is Gal 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 When we were young, we we used to come to uh, to, to to the top of Tel Mozan, looking for uh, for artifacts, small artifacts as a game, as uh, such as human figurines or uh, animal figurines, uh, un uncompleted uh, 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 artifacts. We we used to uh, bring them and uh, restore them with uh, with the clay and. و دور من من از آنی بگویم کار که من چه کردم و چیکی یعنی چیکی متعدد هی مشکل رو پیدا نیست من از آنی بگویم که اشتنا هنی و دوری جی من از آنی بگویم روک به و گری مزاب به چی روک جمره و به گوتن پیشی که مزیم بدن. We did not realize that this art this artifact represent our heritage and we did not know that our hill contains tales. Will uh, will be uh, told to us uh, one day uh, about our ancestors. During the past, we have seen that the people of the Garia Mali, the Hashde, the Shashada, the Golava, the Nadi, the Mozart, the Golan. In in 1986, and after I uh, finished uh, military service, I uh, came to my village. I I saw a foreigner working in Tel Mozan. As you have seen, we were working in Petrake, but in Negalaki. I worked with them uh, with, with them for a short time, uh, so and then I uh, didn't uh, like the work. I left the work and I, I went to to home. And then uh, I remember uh, Professor Merlin Kiri Buchilati Um Skander, as he said, uh, uh, sent a request for me to. Uh, Uh, to uh, uh, to uh, to work again. The <laughs> When I was working with with them, I I, I used to hear uh, somebody say that uh, our hill is is called the uh, the lost city in the world, and it is a more important uh, a more important uh, civilization in the Middle East. So I wondered why a foreigner uh, should uh, take care of uh, of this uh, of our heritage. It's it's mine. This this hill is mine. It's uh, for uh, it belong to to my village, and we have to preserve it. Dur as Kerem Haris, Basaj Nadiyas Kerem Haris, Jamana, who jam Masuri better rashte, Masuri a grand rashte, who better jal hakiyat am khatabu. And after I became a, a guard of the mission, I I I I I, I begin to feel that I'm responsible of my uh, my heritage. Yes. And also, I, I, I felt that I, uh, I, I became responsible of, the, of many tales will, uh, will be told one day for, my, for, for us and for our children about our ancestors. I'm very grateful and thank you uh, for everyone I have uh, worked with them. Thank you so much, Um Skander and Abu Skander, uh, Professor Giorgio, Professor Marlin. Uh, and many thanks for uh, Yasmin Mahmoud uh, uh, for uh, what uh, what she 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 has done for us. Uh, I am very happy and uh, that I have uh, served, I served, served my, my uh, heritage for more than uh, 30 years. I am very sorry that I am physically 
uh, 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 14 years I, I was uh, physically uh, far off my uh, colleagues. And thank you so uh, so much for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, thank yes. you Mohammed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we're, we're really blessed and grateful um, uh, for what you have shared with us. The, the second um, young Syrian archaeologist is Amr himself, who is um, standing here on the monumental staircase, um, monumental staircase at Tel Mozan. Um, Amr is from Kamisli, the city near Mozan, and he is our staff <clears throat> archaeologist in situ. He is a local inheritor who, we may say, is the conscience at the site, is our conscience at the site, since, of course, we cannot go there in these years. The fact is, presently, um, they are now standing on the staircase. It's 10 o'clock at night for him um, right there. But he will not speak about Orkash, but rather about himself in Orkash um, and what it means to him and his children and to all of the people he helps to um, inherit Orkash. Amr, thank you for coming. And we are very anxious to hear what you have to say. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, would just, uh, I would like to say hello to everyone. Uh, and uh, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to be with you the, uh, in uh, this presentation. Uh, I am talking to you from Syria, from, uh, from Tel Mozan, from the ancient Orkish. As you uh, uh, say, uh, see, I am standing on the staircase of the uh, Orkish temple, which dates back almost to uh, 5,000 years uh, ago. The place and, uh, and uh, the other uh, monuments I have been uh, close to and uh, uh, visited with many uh, people, either from uh, villages and uh, cities around, uh, or even uh, 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 even uh, from outside of, of Syria, um, through all the absence of, of the, the, the mission and during the Syrian uh, crisis. Uh, 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 that uh, that uh, thing and uh, the other uh, other uh, works I I did in uh, Tel Mozan made me more uh, attracted to one uh, uh, to one archaeological to an archaeological uh, site. Uh, I I had uh, uh, hoped to be one of its archaeological team when I was a student in the University of Damascus. But when I uh, get uh, in working. Uh, uh, involved. When I got involved in, in, in working in Orkish project, I, I began to feel other things. I began to feel that there are uh, duties I have to uh, offer to Orkish. And in return, Orkish taught me that archaeology is not just about uh, carrying shovels and axes and, and excavating for antiquities, but archaeology can be the way for communities and uh, societies to uh, to make them uh, more connected with, with their land and their heritage. Uh, things I had uh, read from the eyes of all those who have visited uh, Tel Mozan and from their imagination through their questions and their, inter their great interest uh, for, their, uh, for the, the heritage of their ancestors. Uh, 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 even, even, even though uh, uh, many, Syrians, uh, many Syrians, in times, uh, many Syrians uh, uh, migrated uh, regardless the reason of the migration, but here in Orkish, Orkish gathered people to make them uh, uh, feel deep belonging to their uh, legacy and their uh, roots. For, uh, for me, uh, I, I live in, in an area uh, contains uh, more than 1,000 archaeological uh, sites. But Orkish became part of my life. I cannot get away uh, uh, for, uh, from Orkish. Uh, exactly as a boy cannot uh, move away from his mother. Uh, I am very proud that I am uh, one of uh, Urkish uh, team. Uh, Urkish, uh, where uh, where uh, where has become uh, where, where uh, Urkish has uh, has become uh, become as um, as a model of of community archaeology in a very critical time of uh, Syrian uh, history. I am uh, very enthusiastic to to uh, uh, about working with my uh, colleagues in very near future. Uh, um, Unfortunately, I I, I did uh, I didn't have a chance uh, to to work with with them before the Syrian crisis. Uh, finally, I, I would like to to say a few words. Uh, it's almost uh, midnight at Mozan, and believe me, my love for this place and for my uh, my ancestors 
uh, heritage made me bear this very cold night to uh, attend uh, with you this presentation. Again, thank you, uh, thank you uh, so much for everyone, and uh, thank you uh, very uh, a great thanks for uh, from here from uh, Urkesh, from Muzan to Damascus to to you, Yasmin, and uh, many thanks for my colleague who is uh, bearing me uh, beyond the camera, my colleague Montasar Qasim. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Ahmed, uh, Ahmed for um, for sharing us with us your experience. Um, the next young archaeologist um, is coming to us um, from Florence, Italy. Um, but she grew up in Kamishli, um, the site, the city near us. And she became an archaeologist at an early age. I have to tell you, she came to us asking to, to become part of our, um, of our team. She was barely out of high school. I couldn't believe it. Um, but she knew what she wanted to do. And, and as you can see, um, she has never left us or the site. Um, even though in the meantime, she's gotten a PhD in archaeology. And now she lives and works in Florence, Italy. Hey, but we're very happy that you're part of our team, and we're extremely happy that you're able to share your experience of the heritage of Workash with us today. Thank you very much, Marilyn. Actually, I am so happy to be here and so happy that I came that day, which is like now it's it was in 2006, though the first time I put a foot on the site was in 2005 when I had 18 years old. So back then, actually, I was in a tour with the Department of Archaeology and we visited Mozan as many other sites in the region. And Urkesh was impressive seeing Urkesh near, near Kamushti. Unlike all the other sites in the region, it was all, it was well preserved and well presented and we were finally able to understand the site. So then Muhammad Omo appeared and he was uh, insisting on offering us further explanations and he knew about the site. And I was wondering, how did he know all this information about the site? <laughs> I mean, usually the guards didn't really step in and try to add more information on the professor. So he acted like if he owns the site and the, the year after, I said, I will join them. <laughs> I should go there where finally you can see the monuments and not only the ruins and also locals belong there. So, and here it started the story, my story in Mozan and since 2006. And since then, actually Mozan was always in my life. I left Syria in 2011 to pursue my PhD in Florence, and though Mozan was, was also a central theme in my PhD, not because of its importance, of, because of its historical importance, but more because of its unique present, I had always in mind the local engagement I witnessed in, in Mozan, especially in opposite to, to museums empty of locals in Damascus or Aleppo. So here it was the big challenge to uncover the, 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 the secrets of, of the recipes that you, you made in Mozan. And, and if this community, community engagement can be repeated or, or if it can be applied somewhere else. So um, as what Marilyn said before, I'm from Kamishli, which is a small modern uh, town. It doesn't have an old part, an old city like Damascus or Aleppo, so people don't really have a, a living heritage, like uh, going to an, an old mosque or old church. Though visiting archaeological sites wasn't really um, a common habit among, among the people. So um, when I, since I started working, my friends and, and my family were curious what I was doing there all summers. So we decided to visit the site. And actually, they were so impressed and their, their attitude toward the site was different after their visit. So they started asking the new, about the new discoveries. They were always in touch with me to see if 
for how we are protecting the sites. Even now, when, when we are not there, they were always trying to ask and see what happened to the site. Though, when, when uh, I went back to, to, to Aleppo to continue the year, because I was studying there, the archaeology, they kept going to the site. They were taking their friends and, and sending me photos. Then they stopped considering me and they were just going with their friends. It's, it became their own destination because it's basically the only place that you can really understand the site, even for, for average people, for, for people who are not archaeologists. And to tell the truth, like what Mozan is for me and what Urkesh is for me now, it's been almost 10 years since I left Syria. And, and when I'm homesick, I don't really, and here I'm glad my parents were not able to attend for what I'm going to say. I don't think of my house or my room. I just close my eyes, think of Mozan, and I feel home. And this is what really Urkesh is for me. And I guess a lot of people. Yeah, thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you, thank you, Eva. That is so beautiful, really. Um, the next uh, Syrian student is Ronina, who is another person who um, is from Kamishli. Um, However, she departed when she was very young and she didn't know um, much about Orkesh. But she discovered Orkesh as a student at UCLA. And um, she is now studying remotely from Germany. So she's going to talk to us from Germany, but she's a student at UCLA. So Ronita will share with us um, what Orkes has come to be to her. Hello, everyone. And thank you so much, uh, Professor Giorgio and uh, Professor Marilyn Buccellati. Um, so my name is Ronita, and I am a second year student at UCLA. Uh, the first course that I actually took in anthropology was um, in 2019, in fall 2019, uh, with uh, Professor Monica Smith, who I think is also here with us today. Um, hi, Professor. I can't see you amongst all the squares, but uh, I hope you're doing well. And um, so basically, the, there was one particular um, lecture during my course about the archaeology of Mesopotamia. And um, this was a particularly interesting uh, lecture for me because I am originally myself Kurdish from um, Kamishli, like many of the other speakers were. And so um, this was a really special um, lecture for me. And so even though I'm currently living with my family in Germany, um, I wanted to share this with my mom because it was so uh, meaningful to me. And so I. I told her about the lecture that we learned and she in turn um, told my uncle, her brother about it. And actually it turned out that my uncle knew, he knew about a team from UCLA, um, an archeology span team who worked there. And through that way, I actually got to know um, Professor Buccellati. And as it turned out, his office was actually right opposite my discussion section at Fowler Museum. So it was incredibly, uh, incredibly amazing to meet him and get to work with him. Um, basically, I um, I started working with, on the smaller projects that um, he gave me, and I was really glad to be able to reconnect with that part of my heritage because uh, when I was about nine years old, I actually visited Telmozan with um, my family. But back then I was too young to fully um, be aware of the precious moment that the precious trip that I actually made because afterwards, um, Syria, obviously there was the Syrian war. And so I, I haven't gotten any chance to visit that place again. Um, so that makes me very homesick, but at the same time, I'm also still very um, actively engaged with uh, Urkesh and Telmozan through uh, what, uh, Professor Buccellati is working on at the moment. And um, in fact, not too long ago, I sent him a video um, with Mohammed Omo, I think, and we translated that. Um, through that, I got to learn so much more than I initially thought I knew about uh, my heritage and that place, Tel Mozan. And so um, it's actually, uh, it was also amazing to find out that 
there are still very much many communities living in Tel Mozan at the moment. And just as much as um, it's part of the history and um, archaeology that others learn about, it's also part of the personal connection that the people living there at the moment have. And um, I also personally have family living there at the moment. Um, so it's still very much uh, a part of my heritage and um, I try to stay connected to it that way. So I'm really glad to have had the opportunity to work with everyone um, on this experience. And I hope to hopefully get another chance sooner than later in the future um, to go back and to visit again with this yes. newly gained experience. Yes, we totally agree with you. We want to be back there and to greet you as you walk in and up the hill of the site. Ronita, we're very, very happy that you could share your experience with us today. Thank you. Um, the last of the uh, five Assyrian archaeologists to talk um, is Yasmin, who will speak to us from Damascus. Yasmin is a local non-local, as it is. She's a Syrian um, from, um, not from Kamishli, um, but she will, she has been um, a member of our team for many years now and is about to get her PhD um, in Pavia, Italy. And she will tell us about what archaeology and uh, Orcus mean to her and to the other Syrians that she has been in contact with over all of these years. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Marilyn. It's really nice to see so many uh, familiar faces also from uh, Mozan. Um, I consider myself one of the lucky people who got to uh, work with this expedition uh, from a very young age. I think I was 19 years old when I joined the expedition. And I got to experience firsthand uh, the power of archaeology, not only on the, on the technical level, but also how it can impact communities around it and even uh, further away. Um, the events then in Syria for the past 10 years, as painful as they were, I think they highlighted even further this uh, aspect of archaeology, because I also got to witness firsthand um, that despite all the differences between Syrians, it seemed that there was an unspoken agreement amongst all Syrians about archaeological monuments and about archaeological sites. And it seemed that at one point, it was the only thing that unified Syrians, probably, whether it was on, an un on a conscious level or an unconscious level, it was a unifying factor for all Syrians. And I can't think of a better example to, to demonstrate this than Urkish, because here you have people from all over the world, from different continents, and you have Syrians from different backgrounds and from uh, different ethnic groups all working together and all feeling a sense of belonging to the site and working with such synergy that I've never seen anywhere else. So um, I think this is the true power of archaeology and because it is a major factor of unifying people. And um, I always think about it because when I think about Urkish and I think that it's, it's, it's more than just a site with uh, monuments, it's also, it, it's our heritage, but what makes it our heritage, I think it's this invisible threat, threat that pulls us all together. And I think that especially in countries where you are in constant and daily contact with archeological monument, like for example, Syria or Italy, where you walk am amongst archaeological sites all the time, it becomes an integral part of who you are. And this thread, I think, pulls people even closer together. And this speaks volumes, especially when you see a site, let's say, that is not a touristic site in the traditional sense, like Tal Mozan is. Um, when you see people having such a strong reaction to a site from the Bronze Age, where things are a bit more hard, are, are a bit more hard to to understand or to explain, and you see people having this reaction towards Urkish, and you see this strong connection that Urkish is capable of creating with people, I think this is where the thread becomes even more visible, because. Um, in Urkish, you can see people from different backgrounds and different ethnicities all managed to be connected 
I think on a spiritual level, even it, 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 it kind of connects the souls of the people. And this is what Urkesh managed to do. I had something else in mind I wanted to say about heritage, but when Hiba spoke about home, I thought that I wanted to say to, to share something. I think it's a powerful moment for me because in a way, everyone who worked in Mozan think about it or consider it as a home. Um, when I went to Mozan in 2018, everyone around me thought that I was crazy. My family, my friends, they all advised me not to do it because the situation was not very safe. The area is not under the government's control. No one can predict what could happen. But still, I went to Mozan. It was spring and I was standing on the hill overlooking the palace and everything was so green. And I can see the newborn sheep roaming around freely on the tail. And there was just this slight drizzle of rain. And I never felt more serene in my whole entire life, which was ironic because we're not very far away from a conflict zone and you see military troops anywhere you turn. And it's not the safest environment. It's not the safest place. And all of Syria was like that at that time, but still I felt so serene. And it made me think that only at home you can feel this serene when everything around you is not so safe. And I think the fact that we all th think about Mozan as our home and we feel that it's our home, it's, I think, the only thing that made us not lose hope because it's very easy to lose hope, especially for us living in Syria where the situation got really, really difficult at times. It's, it, it's never losing hope because we never lose hope of returning to our home. So thank you, Hiba, for bringing the notion of home because I think it touches all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was very moving. Um, your Thank testimony, you. really, yes, I mean, um, and and we all feel that you know that the sense of community um, is what brings us together in a very deep way. Yeah. Um, as you can tell from these Syrian interlocutors, um, there there is this. Um, very, very close attachment to Orkesh and what the archaeology of Orkesh um, means to um, the wider community. And um, I, I just wanted to um, thank um, everyone who has um, given their um, witness from Mozan today. And maybe you want to sum up? Yeah. Um, also, because we want to still have a few minutes for questions, if there are any. Uh, we had thought we might have time for more reflections about the theory uh, but <laughs> of heritage. But in effect, I think that what uh, we have all heard and seen um, is greater than any sort of theoretical statement. Yes. Uh, it's really the living tradition. Two of the words that recurred in these, uh, we didn't rehearse, by the way, this at all. Everybody spoke... Uh, from the heart. And one of the things that came through, two words that struck me that were repeated were ancestors and children. In a way, that is really the, uh, the whole point of linking the future with the past, no matter how remote the past is. And um, our goal as archeologists, I feel, is to be the interpreters of this past. We do have a competence. We cannot, we do not want to become more local than the locals. We bring our own competence and it is through this competence, if it is well explained and well presented, that this kind of synergy, as Yasmin was saying, uh, grows and, uh, and develops. So, um, it's really the um, um, the goal. Now, I want to end with um, these um, uh, two texts that I put in the abstract uh, <clears throat> because they tell us something about the ancient inheritors when they felt themselves. Where is Gilgamesh, who, like his ancestors, Yusudra, sought eternal life? Where are those great kings who came long before our own days. Above, there are houses where they dwelt, but it is below 
that there are the houses that last forever. This is a Sumerian text about 2000 BC. And we're excavating the houses where they are. That's right. And also the houses that last forever, the, the tombs that we buried. But see, this gives you a sense of the sensitivity that the ancients had. And then this one, which is Babylonia from the first millennium, go up in any of the ancient tells. Uh, this is the same word in Sumerian and in Akkadian as it is today in Arabic for a cultural mound. The ancient tells and walk about, see the skulls of people from ages past and from yesteryear. Can you tell the difference? It's beautiful because it shows us both the monuments, the houses, and the items, in this case, is the skulls of people on the uh, surface of, uh, the, of these uh, tells. So just like the ancients felt their past, they have communicated to us this sense of belonging in their past, so are we feeling it today. And they, I think this is really the iconic image that I had at the beginning, which comes to life in a very special and perhaps new way once we see why there is so much enthusiasm. It's not an ephemeral enthusiasm. It's something that is rooted very, very deeply. And uh, we really want to acknowledge the fact that we have gotten so, many, so much support from the foundations. It's, you see, just like the excavation, the relationship to the people, the relationship to our supporters is really more than just uh, casual. There has always been a great sense of uh, um, synergy, again, uh, which makes the funding, uh, the funding is of course essential, but the uh, psychological sharing of the goal is uh, just as important. So we thank all of them as we thank all of you for being here with us today.